Well, uh, good morning. My name is Jared Mori. I'm the associate pastor here. It is my pleasure to be with you and to introduce this presentation from the Dismantling Racism team of our congregation. Uh, the Dismantling Racism team has been meeting for a year and a half uh, and has engaged in our context um, and our Methodist context, our Northfield context, our Minnesota context uh, to discern what would it look like, what does it mean for us to dismantle racism uh, when we hear the change agents are the people of Northfield United Methodist Church. One of the approaches that we took, we gave a presentation on, or we heard from last week, the Central Conference Pensions Initiative. Another approach that we're taking is by looking at our own history with the land. So today is a presentation on a land acknowledgement statement uh, which you've seen in your emails and in the Herald and we'll be passing out a copy uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, the team has done a lot of research around this and you'll be hearing from different members of the team on the research that has been done and as well we will have time for small group conversations in the second half of this piece uh, and a time for open questions and curiosities and affirm affirmations once we reach the end. But to begin, Will you please join me in a brief prayer? Lord, we ask you to be present in our hearts, our thoughts, and our words in this time. We thank you for the ability to be here. We ask you to show us a path forward as we continue our efforts to dismantle racism, understanding that this is one way that you call justice to roll like an ever-flowing stream. <clears throat> Amen. All right, can I invite the next slide? All right, what is a land acknowledgement? Uh, this is a quick, easy video. Uh, like this, they watch. All right. On God's green earth, we might do the Lakota tradition of acknowledging four directions of the land and the people living there. Uchimaka, as I call it, Grandmother Earth, the land. I view her as a a sacred, you know, living entity, and that's the way we acknowledge it in, you know, Lakota thought and philosophy. As a Native person, I'm ready for any kind of confrontation that might come up, or I'm preparing myself to remind people of all those things that they forget about. We are still here. I was at a meeting in Minneapolis, and the room was primarily non-Native people. I was in a non-Native organization, but this executive director got up and said, okay, we're gonna get started. So everybody you know, was sitting down and getting quiet. And she said, I'd like to get started by acknowledging the indigenous culture of this, of Minnesota. And I was like, first, I was like, wow. And it just made everything like fall away a little bit from me. My guard went down, I was more relaxed. Because by saying that, like, that means she understands something that is just like, you can't talk about, right? There's just, it just relaxed me as a minority, as a woman, and as a native person. Like it just like like pulled away this layer that's always there, you know. It was super cool. We're at a, we're at a time where um, non-native cultures are understanding the traditions of indigenous peoples for, for probably the first time in our histories. So like when I go to New Zealand, the protocol is to acknowledge each other's ancestors and your mountains and your rivers. And, and, and that's such a beautiful tradition. When people are in that space and say, we acknowledge who you are, this land, the, where your people come from, they're saying we acknowledge your relationship, but we're also creating that relationship. This is a good thing. The important thing would be that folks would then sit with that. Like, what does it mean that our settlement is occupying this space? And what responsibility do I have considering that legacy to these contemporary things, right? And how do I stop distancing myself from that? Ideally, that would be, for me, the impact that this has. If you start acknowledging that the land that you're standing on and the space that you are in belong to people that are still here, like, make so much more room for understanding of all these other issues. It's one of those little things that, like, if it could just tip a little bit, all the, like, dominoes that could fall from it, I think are important. 
Now I'm like imagining it and like wanting to live in that, like <laughs> the thing that I'm imagining, like, yeah, that's actually really beautiful. It's just being a genuine human being to acknowledge each other's histories, um, the good and the bad. names the historical truth of the land that it's on. Uh, where did this land come from? How did it come to be under our possession? How did it come that we are the ones who are currently stewarding it? It's an acknowledgement because in the United States uh, is often the case that uh, it came to us, to our possession, through a forced take from somebody else uh, in this part of Minnesota, from the Dakota people. Uh, it names the historical truth that this land is ours uh, and that the history of how it came to be ours is not a history of fair dealing and everybody being treated equally like a sibling in Christ. It acknowledges that we have an ongoing benefit from the fact that this land uh, was unjustly taken, that there is a history of coercion and violence on this land that made it ours and that there are ways that we benefit from it. The fact that we own this, that we are landowners, that we're able to uh, benefit from it, use it as a space for our purposes, uh, and that it's not a space, uh, th that it came to us again uh, through unjust means, that we are benefiting from that injustice. Acknowledging the land opens the doors for repentance for us. It lets us acknowledge the history of this land and of this space and figure out what does it mean then for us to live into righteousness, what does it mean for us to, um, to repent of the unjust history and to work towards justice with clear eyes about what has happened so that we can together imagine a world that is more just than the one in which we live. It helps us to create a more just world and it helps us imagine how we can better love our neighbors. Uh, land acknowledgement acknowledges that we do have active neighbors, that there are Dakota who are around us still, um, and how are we called to be in relationship with them uh, when this land was uh, ultimately coerced and stolen from their ancestors. Next slide. It connects to our faith in a few ways. Uh, the Bible, especially the Hebrew Bible, is like half about land and the history of land. Uh, Genesis, the first story we hear is about land. How did we come to be on the land? What was happening on the land? What was special about the land? The Garden of Eden. The people of Exodus were going to a place that was their own land. They were pursuing their own land. Even as they were pursuing their own land, there were other people who were on that land that they were going for. Um, land is bound up thoroughly in the biblical story. Therefore, we want to be fully aware of land as it is bound up in our story as Northfield United Methodist Church. In addition, uh, the degree to which the history of this land represents a present and ongoing injustice is one we need to take into account. You see this passage from Matthew here. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come back and offer your gift. We heard in the video some uh, indigenous people in the United States talking about what an impact it makes on them just by hearing a land acknowledgement, how much it makes it, uh, how much they welcome those words and how it affects them when they're in a space uh, that other organizations are holding. Uh, knowing that there is an unjust history to our land, this also helps us to figure out how can we be in right relationship with those who may have something against us or with those to whom our ancestors or our organization's ancestors may have done some injustice. <clears throat> and we have, a, we have a call to reconciliation. How can we be reconciled with our neighbors in this place, uh, through this land? In the 2012 General Conference, to which I was a lay delegate, George Tinker, who you see pictured here, uh, led the 
entire United Methodist Church General Conference, uh, people gathered from all over the world who had been elected to come uh, be with their folks in what was called then a process of repentance. Um, he talked about the doctrine of discovery, uh, a fundamental idea that any land not inhabited by Christians, uh, that Christians were obligated to control it so that they could uh, convert the people of that land to the faith. Uh, this was a legal doctrine that was enforced by colonial powers uh, that gave us the sense that, okay, well, since there aren't any Christians here, we can claim this land as our own when the colonists came over from Europe. He talked about Colonel John Shivington, uh, who led the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864. Uh, it happened in Oklahoma, over 100 uh, indigenous people, including uh, many women and children, were slaughtered unfairly. Uh, Colonel Shovington was also the preacher at his local United Methodist Church. Uh, he was the leader of, that, uh, of his United Methodist Church, while at the same time being a key leader of the Sand Creek Massacre. So we as a Methodist people are connected with acts of violence against indigenous people in the United States. Um, the act of repentance challenged every conference and local congregation to implement actions demonstrating a genuine attitude of repentance, including encouragement and resourcing education uh, of laity and pastors, uh, giving primacy to learning and prioritizing Native American United Methodists uh, and their history, establishing Native ministries. Here in Minnesota, we do have that. Um, and to know that wherever the church holds land and trust like this, uh, to give priority and consideration to the land and to transferring a portion of the land or property back to the tribes that are or were indigenous to the area. So these were things that the general conference uh, was called upon to do in the act of repentance that was passed. All right. <laughs> now, that's the broad image. To drill down a little more locally, uh, Tracy's going to share some information that she's like. Yeah, so as a group, um, we realized that to come up with the land acknowledgement statement that felt genuine to our congregation um, versus, say, adopting the one that the city has, which is a great example and a great start, but we wanted to make it more um, personal. So we realized that we needed to do some research and see what we could learn about the history of this specific place. So this is just a list um, to give you an idea of the types of places we went to do the, resource, the research. So the Minnesota Conference Archives is a great resource and um, started there. And the archivist provided some newspaper articles um, that, are, that were very informative. Um, like they talked about every pastor that had been here since the beginning. And um, so that was some good information. Um, the printed histories of our specific church, um, I think there might even be a third, but there was a Diamond Jubilee at 75 years anniversary. This one is the 100 year anniversary, so these are some good reading. Um, there's also this Methodist Trails in Minnesota, which was done in 1966. So this isn't specific to our congregation, but it is specific to Minnesota. Um, so these were really good source materials to see what our church has said about itself in past years. Um, um, Pastor Rachel did a little bit of uh, legal work trying to figure out what we could learn about the, um, the deed to this specific building. So we, we went there. Um, and then also um, there's some really good things online. Um, these three specifically are ones that um, I think several of us watched and talked about. Um, the city of Northfield, um, you can go on their website and under their land acknowledgement tab, there's a whole video you can watch about how they came up with that one and um, the some of the historical background and then also a really good discussion of what a responsible land acknowledgement should include. Um, that was um, Dr. Meredith McCoy, who's um, faculty at Carleton. And she does that presentation. She was also then um, responsible for the Carleton College, um, one of her history classes. She I, obviously spent um, a large chunk of their semester working on a project around the history of Carleton specifically and its connection to um, 
how, well, all kinds of things. But So that's really informative. It is specific about Carleton, but obviously it speaks to the larger Northfield area. And then um, there was a program that the library did um, that um, I can't remember who the speakers were, and I can write it down, but that was a really good overview of the um, history of this area in terms of the stories definitely hold the settlers in high esteem. Um, they call them pioneers. Um, 75th did a whole pageant called the Spirit of Pioneers. Um, and the whole, you can read what, what they, what, how the pageant went. I mean, the whole thing is in here. Um, so their, you know, their bravery and their sacrifices come up over and over again in these histories. So is that a bad thing? No. Um, I mean, pioneers, they did sacrifice, they worked hard, they, it wasn't easy. Um, but I think the important thing is to remember is that's not the whole story. Um, when we tell our history, what are we leaving out? Who's not mentioned? Um, and how do we address that now? So obviously who's missing from these stories are the people who lived here before the settlers arrived and were still here. Um, and there's not, um, there's a few mentions of indigenous people in here. So I pulled out basically what I could find, which isn't much. Um, from the Di Diamond Jubilee, um, yeah, until 1850, this is right at the beginning under the heading Pioneer Period. So until 1852, when the growing needs of the Great West created an imperative need for the lumber, which was found in such abundance, not much was known about this part of the country. True, it was known that the great Mississippi had its source here and that the state also held the falls of St. Anthony, but as a site for human habitation, it was considered impossible. So that's a really good example of erasure. Um, clearly, it wasn't impossible for human habitation. There were people inhabiting this space since the Ice Age, or the end of the Ice Age, or whatever. So um, yeah, that one really struck me um, as not accurate and that's what we call erasure. The second one um, is actually from the trails, the Methodist trails in Minnesota. Um, and uh, I think I have it marked, because reading the whole, let's see, where is it? Yeah, now in 1865, the soldiers of the Civil War were returning to re-enter civilian life. The warring Indians had been removed to their several reservations, and all was quiet on the western front. So, um, that's the only specific time I've seen like the word Indian or anything was appeared in here, and you can see that it's like tidy box. Okay, that problem has been resolved. Now we can move on to talking about other things. Um, okay, so what was the actual story of the people who were being left out? And this is like super broad overview. Um, this is the homelands of the Midwakatan and Wapakuti lands of the Dakota people. Um, the Northfield is on land that was seized during the treaties. There were two treaties in 1851. And um, basically this map shows like all the land that was seeded during those two treaties. And this strip right here is what um, was theoretically saved for the Dakota people and they were supposed to move there. It's right along the river. It was, it was a sweet piece of land, but so you can imagine how long they got to keep that to themselves. That didn't last very long. Um, and even in the original, in the treaties, you know, not all the different bands, they didn't all sign it. Some did. They felt like they had no choice. Others didn't. So that started to create tension between the bands. Um, and then the treaty, all the great money that they were supposed to get from the treaties didn't really happen. Um, so the Dakota people, were struggling for resources and they were being used to like fight, you know, spy on each other and all kinds of stuff. And so eventually the, that led to the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. Um, and after that, um, the state officially exiled them from the state, canceled the treaties. And um, so it didn't, didn't go well for the Dakota people. Um, I wanted to point out the last point that even though they were exiled, that doesn't mean that there are, like Jared already said, there are Dakota people here. Um, some of them probably never left, and others started to come back and quietly set up 
settlements um, in the ensuing years, and um, and then there was some official recognition. Um, I don't have the dates for that, but currently there are four Dakota reservations in southern Minnesota. So, um, so three takeaways that I got from this: um, one, that it's really easy to learn about this stuff. There's like tons of resources out there. Um, there's the paper we're going to give you has some that you could start with if you want to learn more about the specific area. There's a resource list down here. Um, there's a treaty um, uh, presentation going on, or display going on right now at Carleton for one more week. So if you want to go take a look at that, you need to get over there this week. And it goes into um, about trees and all kinds of things about trees. I think, and there's a, um, well, tomorrow, one reason we're doing this today is tomorrow is Indigenous Peoples Day. So I know there's going to be some events going on in Carleton related to that. Um, so yeah, we don't really have any excuse to not know about our history. Um, the second thing is that you can see on the timeline, North, our congregational establishment was right in the middle of all of this. Um, the land trees, the land was seized in 1851. Settlers started coming right after that. Church gets founded. Um, all that's going on while this is getting played out throughout the southern part of the state. So our history really can't be separated from this history, and we need to acknowledge that and um, remember that, yeah, we are here as an outcome of those treaties. Um, and then again, this isn't just our history, the story isn't over. The Dakota people are still here, and one of the reasons that we wanted to do a land acknowledgement statement, which Jared has already touched on, is that we need to think about how we're going to respond and what we do going forward to develop that relationship with our neighbors. And I think Richard is next. I'm Richard Coleman, one of the many retired pastors haunting this place. <laughs> um, I did some investigation with community um, research going on, and, and Mar Valdecantos lives just down the street from me in Fairway, and we finally got ourselves together after two months of trying. And she's a very interesting person. I would refer you to the recent Northfield paper this last Tuesday and Wednesday, or last Wednesday, with the title Indigenous People's Day Celebration in Northfield. She recounts there some of the things she told me. She's headed a diverse subcommittee of the Human Rights Commission of the Northfield City Council since um, Oh, back quite a few years, uh, 2014, the uh, Human Rights Commission approached the City Council to pass a resolution about designating uh, tomorrow as Indigenous Peoples Day. That resolution failed, but it wasn't until 2018 that the City Council actually adopted it. And uh, Mar's groups, uh, the group that Mar headed, their goal was to pursue ways to connect with Native neighbors locally and also beyond our city, and also explore ways to repair a relationship severed by colonization and genocide. Interesting to me that the word genocide has just entered our vocabulary since we've started uh, looking at our history with the Native American peoples. Mar readily acknowledges that as a Spanish woman from old century Spain, she is part of the colonization effort too. Um, the colleges, of course, have added uh, Wapokata, Wapakata and other bands to the city council statement, and it was not the purpose of our DRT, Dismantling Racism Team group in this church, to reproduce either city council or Carleton or St. Olaf statements, but to kind of craft our own on the basis of what's been done. There's been an Ojibwe intern in the Human Rights Commission, as well as a Carleton Ojibwe professor involved in the consultation with their group. And it was interesting to me that Mara Valdecantos' group has been working uh, beyond land acknowledgement. It's not just that issue, it's bigger than that. They're exploring different venues and connections and scholarships. They're exploring renaming the Cannon River. Places like Standing Rock that they are calling power places as compared with sacred sites. And she made me aware that the Prior Lake uh, Midewakanton Tribal Group has this amazing history center called the Dwellers of the Lake that should be visited. And I think we've got information out on that already in the Herald and other places. One of the most immediate things that happened for me 
was Friday, October 8th. I went over to the Carlton Convocation to hear David, Professor David, um, or Professor Anton Truer, T-R-E-U-E-R, who's written an amazing book called The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, and that's tracing Aboriginal peoples from 1500 BC to the present. It's a 600 some page book. He's very articulate. He's just moved back to Minnesota. He's on the staff at Bemidji State University. He was given a huge uh, grant to develop uh, Native American languages, particularly Ojibwe, for the Mille Lacs or Leech Lake Band. He's working on that. His newest book is called The Language Warrior. And what impressed me about Truer's discussion or, or presentation at Carlton on Friday was he did not denigrate or trash the colonialism or the whites. He simply said they are one story among many. And he says, we live in a shut-up culture. And when you live in a shut-up culture, it's hard to get your story out there. Uh, he's very articulate, and I recommend his book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. So that's only one event. Uh, Tracy referred to a couple others coming. The Prairie Island Indian community will be sending some of their staff to Carleton tomorrow, an event from noon to 6. And uh, the display is still going on uh, on the treaties over at Carleton, too. So there's a lot going on locally, and it involves truth and reconciliation. But Truer reminded me, the first thing is we have to begin telling the truth and be aware of our history and what happened. The second thing way beyond that is what are we going to do about reconciliation? How are we going to deal with that? So I feel the DRT team and the local church has been doing a lot of good work on, uh, on truth telling and trying to find out what really is happening here. So it was interesting to explore the, uh, the community reference with Mar and others too and realize how much work is being done uh, in this area on this subject. Thank you. women did a book study of bearing witness in the kingdom, living into the church's moral witness through radical discipleship. This is by Daryl Stevens, and in the book he says, the moral witness of our church encompasses our participation as Christians in God's response to suffering and injustice in light of what we believe about God and God's intention to reconcile all creation. <clears throat> Through prayerful listening, we learn to discern how to live into the church's moral witness. As the Methodist church moved westward, it took on the mindset the Indian is savage and needed to be civilized. The elder, even an elder, went out so far as to plan and execute the massacre of Sand Creek, which Pastor Jared mentioned. It is a moral burden Methodists must carry, recognizing the brokenness of past relationships and confessing our role in breaking them. Repentance begins with a commitment to redress past harms. Understanding repentance includes confession, ceasing harm, intent to change, restitution, and a desire for healing and restoration. Minnesota Methodists today are starting the long journey to restitution and repentance. The former Native American Ministry Action Team, or NAMAP, uh, has now been reformatted and spoke with the group's chair, Reverend Don Hauser, who stated that CONAM's mission is to build relationships with and between Native Americans and other cultures in Minnesota. We should be asking, how can we help you rather than trying to meet needs we see that Native Americans have? We need to build relationships in service, as well as in reconciliation with other Minnesotans. Don said that in 2012, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church held an act of repentance ceremony, which has been mentioned, and everyone was supposed to go back to their states and return the red rock in their own act of repentance ceremony. I guess there was an actually red rock that was given to someone from each state. Minnesota has not had their ceremony because 
there is disagreement among the tribes as to where the red rocks should return. From this disagreement, Conan is trying to forge a different path in rebuilding relationships between Native Americans and their, as well as their white brothers and sisters. Reverend Don Hauser is part of, she is part of Anishinaabe as well as Caucasian. She is a licensed local pastor with an emphasis in the Native American course of study. She also serves the Aiken United Methodist Church. She says, ministry on the reservations has been difficult due to COVID-19. Things have been shut down like every other place that we know of. And Dawn herself is fighting COVID right now. She contacted it up the drum ceremony. In conjunction with the drum, a retired clergy person is gifting a native peace pipe to Conan. It will be used in peace ceremonies or pipe ceremonies when speaking about Native American spiritual practices. Native American and Christian spirituality are very supportive of each other. Monies for Conam are also used to travel to build relationships with elders on their reservations in Minnesota and for sharing and educating congregations about the cultural and native spiritual practices. Reverend Don spoke about the need of Native American church in Minnesota. This would not be a typical church plant. It would need support over a long period of time. Native American members are very poverty stricken and creating the need for the church to be a mission church. Continued support from the conference and congregants of other churches would be needed over a longer period of time than normal for regular church plants. As Daryl Stevens says, repentance is a journey undertaken in partnership, the foundation of new, more just relationships. It is not enough to say, I'm sorry. The real fruit of repentance is in the relationships that sprout, <clears throat> that sprout from it. Thank you, Catherine. So we're handing out the land acknowledgement statement right now. Uh, the key elements of a land acknowledgement are that it is specific. Why did we not use the one from the city or from the colleges? Because we wanted it to be specific to our own history. Uh, they also have to acknowledge the ongoing presence of Native Americans with us still, not as people isolated in the past, and it has to name an impact. What does it mean that we are acknowledging this land? How do we understand justice to be in this space? I will read it aloud as you have it in front of you. Northfield United Methodist Church acknowledges that our church and its property stand on the homelands of the Wapakute and uh, Maduakan bands of the Dakota Nation, we'll correct that, we honor with gratitude the people who have stewarded the land through our generations and their ongoing contributions to this region. We know that the earliest days of our congregation were contemporaneous with John North establishing the town boundaries on land recently ceded by the Dakota in an 1851 treaty. We know that after the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, the state of Minnesota forcibly exiled the remaining Dakota people from this area. We confess that the storytelling done by the Northfield with our Dakota neighbors and working towards authentic acts of healing. Uh, take five minutes uh, and consider these questions. How does your faith and relationship with Christ connect with the land acknowledgement statement? We are a church. How does your faith and your relationship with Christ connect with the statement? And then what questions or curiosities does this statement or what else you've heard in the presentation thus far bring to mind for you? I encourage you to begin. Thank you for having a great conversation. It sounds like there's a lot of life and energy and uh, things emerging. Uh, this is an opportunity for us now to bring uh, what emerged in your small group back to the large space. So, uh, would anybody care to report back on how uh, you felt that your faith connects with this statement? Or what came up in your group around that? Well, I think in our group we uh, acknowledged, first of all, that the statement was well thought out and uh, uh, well done. Uh, I think it uh, covers a lot of, of, uh, uh, a lot of the acknowledgement that <laughs> yeah. 
Um, we appreciate it, Justin, the bottom line. Uh, one thing, as far as our relationship with Christ, uh, <clears throat> history is what we, uh, what is written, and those that have written the history that we learn in, in school, I know I did, was written by, you know, the Anglo, uh, uh, and made the natives turn out to be the bad people, and, 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 and the settlers, the good people. And we know that's not true. We do know, uh, you know with any research that, uh, the white people came in. They cheated the Native Americans. They mistreated them. They pushed them far enough where they uh, became warriors and fought back. And we say, well, there was a you know, Native American uprising, and you know, there are such bad people. Well, <laughs> it's just that you know, because they were uh, not having mistreated them. And, and uh, uh, you know, what would Christ think of this? You know, we came in as uh, Christians, and we said. Uh, uh, with our Bible and our guns, we're going to take this land. And that's the fact of the truth is. And to acknowledge that, uh, you know, that to do something is very important. All right, so I, I hear you saying that your relationship with Christ, especially as it connects to the history of Christians in this space, that our relationship with Christ now compels us to tell a truer history and to repent of uh, some of the historical actions of others who've claimed a similar allegiance. Thank you. What else has come up in your conversations around your faith, your relationship with Christ, connect, in connection with this statement? history by creating a legacy of truth telling. Thank you. As for the second question, what questions or curiosities does the statement or the overall presentation raise for you? As you may know, the Ed Council is considering adopting this as an official statement of the congregations. Was going to be taking notes for this part? I've got that note. Okay, good. All right. What would an authentic act of healing be? Thank you. What other questions or curiosities does the statement or the presentation bring for you? church and as individuals to reconcile. Right. And did anything else emerge from your small group that you'd like to share with the larger group? We talked a little bit about the identification of the church with colonial powers. You know, and, and now that always seems to be simultaneous and rarely is it otherwise. Um, and there's difficulty there. Right. Yeah, so how to, how to decomplicate or how to perceive in a more righteous fashion our relationship with colonial powers or to change and justify, righteousize our relationship with colonial powers. Make right. Make right our colonial relationships in history. Also, we have to work with the Native Americans in order to figure out what the, the, the right answer or the response should be. Because you, you're taking it away from somebody else that has it and giving it back, that, that creates two wrongs. And what should we do together? What would really help them and us live together? Great. What can we do in relationship with 
indigenous peoples in our area? And how can we shape whatever we do in partnership? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. All right, Dave. Oh, Dave. Well, one thing that struck me was the word stewardship. The Native Americans or indigenous peoples were stewards of the land. They didn't own the land as we understand it today. Mm -hmm. They just protected the land, nurtured the land, passed it on to the next generations. So that, that's a challenge in my mind to us of what can we do by way of stewardship to pass on our land, if you will, and, and all, you know, the, the prayer walk popped in my mind and said, there's a possibility. Right. What can we do to further steward this land and to better steward this land that has been so well stewarded before us? Good. Could you advance to the next slide? So, uh, what you've shared has been tracked. Uh, this will be uh, many Ed Council members are here and we'll report back to them about this conversation. Uh, we thank you for engaging it and the Dismantling Racism team will be meeting to figure out uh, a next place to go. Richard had named specifically the opportunity at the, the what's the name of that place in Chocopee? Uh, Mid-Ockenden uh, it's, um, hang on, I'll find it. It's, Oh yeah, Midwakanton Dwellers of the Spirit Lake. It's at the Dwellers of the Spirit Lake. Yeah, it's at the Chakabee Midwakanton Sioux Cultural Center in Chakabee. So one of the things that we've talked about has been organizing just a congregational visit to that site so that we could be there together yeah. as one option. You'll hear more from us. I'd like to thank those members of the Dismantling Racism team, those who have been active with the team, uh, as well as those community resources, Dr. Meredith Helen Coy at Carleton. Uh, Mara Valdecantos, Jessica Intermill, who did a lot of research on the property and the deed uh, in conversation with Pastor Rachel. Uh, the archivists of this church, thanks to whom we have access to documents like the 1931 Diamond Jubilee uh, program, uh, as well as the archivists of the Minnesota Annual Conference and all the members of this congregation who have stewarded the land as long as it has been ours to steward. Thank you for being here. Uh, and if you have any other comments or questions, uh, will those members of the team please raise your hand? So you see who you can talk to uh, or engage with for any other uh, comments or questions you may have about this process. Thank you for being here. <laughs>